In this episode, we're going to talk about the measurement of inequality. I'll talk about some desirable properties for such a measure of inequality. We'll look at a framework for representing the distribution of incomes over Wren's curve, and we'll see how it relates to a specific measure of inequality that's widely used, the Gini coefficient that turns out to satisfy all of the desirable properties. So as we consider desirable properties for indexes of different kinds in economic development and in economics more broadly, first we'd like to see indices that vary from zero to one. We'll do that here. But we also like to make sure that we have an axiomatic approach. That is to say, we like to start with desirable properties for what we would like to see in a measure, what properties we think a measure ought to have to represent what we think it should. And then to check and make sure that any proposed measure satisfies these properties. Specifically with respect to inequality, there are four properties that are almost universally agreed are very important in a proper measure of inequality. There are some additional properties that some propose, but I think that you, it's fair to say these four properties are generally accepted in their importance. And this is going to limit the kinds of inequality measures that we use in economic development analysis. We'll find out that some measures commonly or most commonly talked about in the press and so on actually don't work very well because they don't satisfy all of these properties. First, we begin with anonymity. This is very straightforward. It says that any measure we have of inequality should have nothing to do with the specific people in the economy or whether we think any of them are good people or bad people or anything of this nature. The second is scale independence. And it says that we want a measure of inequality that does not depend on the size of the economy in income terms. In other words, it's about the dispersion of income, not the amounts of income. So if you have one economy and you double everyone's income in that economy, the resulting relative inequality measure according to this criteria should not change. The third is population independence. This means that the way we measure inequality should not have anything to do with the number of people under consideration. So for example, India should not appear either more or less unequal just because it has a lot of people in comparison to other countries or for that matter in comparison to India 20 years ago. Third, we have the transfer principle. And it says that all other incomes constant except for two people if you transfer income from a richer person to a poorer person, the resulting new income distribution is more equal. That makes sense. An important caveat, however, is that there can't be so much transfer that the poorer person is now richer than the originally rich, richer person. And so, otherwise, the transfer principle, sometimes called the Pigou-Dalton uh, principle, is getting at this idea that as income dispersion becomes more compressed in this way, inequality should always show a decrease. Two of the measures of inequality that satisfy all of these properties are the Gini coefficient and the coefficient of variation. If you've taken a class in statistics, you've likely seen the coefficient of variation before. It's just the sample standard deviation divided by the sample mean. And you can see that with respect to standard deviation, it indicates how dispersed the income distribution is, but it's normalized by divided by the sample mean. The Gini coefficient has a close relationship to the Lorenz curve. There are lots of ways of specifically computing your Gini coefficient, four at least. Um, however, we will, in this class, focus on one, its relationship to the Lorenz curve, because I think that's useful in terms of keeping all of our data straight as we go along. This then is the Lorenz curve. 
it represents all of the income recipients in an economy, however we define it. It could be a province, most usually we look at a nation. And on the x-axis, we have the percentage of that population. On the y-axis, we have the cumulative percentage of income. The cumulative part is extremely important, or you won't get in the end with something that has a lot of meaning. So that by convention, we order people from the lowest income person to the highest income person. This ordering is extremely important. Another possible um, way of ordering people that's not nonsense would be from the highest income person to the lowest income person. If you did that, everything is the mirror image of what we look at. What you can't really do is to order people in any other way because then you just get something not systematic that doesn't mean anything. So we should keep that in mind always. And it's cumulative in the sense that the bottom 10% of the income distribution found here at point A represents, oh, looking at it, maybe 2% of national income. When we go then up to the 20th percentile of the population, again, this would be the 20% with the lowest incomes, we are looking at the y-axis now at what is the income of both this bottom decile and the second decile. You're not just adding them as just new information for getting what you had before. Cumulative is very important. This is in deciles, 10, um, ten um, um, groups. At the 90th percentile, we look at the Lorenz curve, we have this point I, maybe it corresponds to, I don't know, 64% of national income or something like that. Getting to this last 10% of the population, that percent that has the highest income, we look at this point I, and their share is a difference between 164 or whatever that was. This then is the idea of the Lorenz curve. And you'll have some exercises in which you can compute the shape of the Lorenz curve with various data in our exercise set three. Here we have a couple of possible examples of Lorenz curves. This one represents relatively low relative inequality, if you want. This one, high in relative inequality. The 45 degree line represents what we call our line of equality or line of perfect equality. And that is because whatever percentage of the population that we choose, if we have, for example, 40% of the population, we find that that corresponds, in that case, to 40% of national income. Of course, if everyone really had the same income, it would be completely arbitrary, a roll of the dice, whichever ones you wanted to declare, the uh, people with the lowest incomes and those with the highest incomes, that would be arbitrary. But nonetheless, you would have a Gini coefficient, as we're going to see in a moment, of zero we will be along this line of perfect equality. In the other possible extreme, at least in the limit, if most people in the economy, starting with the poorest, have close to zero income, and all, or really mostly all of the income goes to the highest income person, we get close to a Lorenz curve that follows these axes. In this case, as we're going to see in a little bit, the resulting Gini coefficient is going to turn out to be 1, with 0, the least or really no inequality, and 1, the most possible inequality that you could really imagine. If the Lorenz curve is a little bit bowed out from the line of perfect equality, you can see that that would likely represent only a small degree of relative inequality. In contrast, here we have a Lorenz curve that's much more bowed out from the line of equality. And this represents a case in which inequality is greater. And this insight, or this perspective, is going to help us in seeing intuitively 
what this Gini coefficient measure is giving us. It's giving us the relative amount by which the Lorentz curve is bowed out. And so that specifically, we write our line of perfect equality along the 45 degree line, representing the case in which everyone in the economy would have the same income. And then we write down our actual Lorentz curve that shows the relationship cumulatively between the percentage of the population always ordered from the lowest income to the highest income in relation to percentage of national income, again, cumulatively. Then the area between this, this um, line of perfect equality and the Lorenz curve gives you this area A. This area A is part of the foundation of this measure of the Gini coefficient. But it is not just A, it's A in relationship to the area of this whole triangle, because we need that in order to be consistent in our units of measurement. So the Gini coefficient is the shaded area, A, divided by this whole triangle, B, C, D. Notice that this, having a ratio of this kind is needed because if somebody wanted to argue that inequality in a country was very small, if it were just about A, we'll just make a little postage stamp size um, graph here of our distribution of income, and lo and behold, our A is very small. So always remember that this ratio has to be taken into account. Now I'm just going to conclude by suggesting that you follow this um, little exercise. I won't do it for you here. You'll have an opportunity to see how these are constructed in the next video. However, consider the case. We have our expression for the Gini coefficient. Now, half the people we're going to assume have an income of one and the other half have an income of two. So it's the, one of the simplest income distributions, certainly, that you, that you could imagine. It sounds, perhaps, at first look, like this is a very unequal distribution of income, but in fact, this would represent a more equal distribution than any country in the world, by some measure, by some degree. So you have this information, half have one, half have two. What does the Lorenz curve look like? So you want to write down the Lorenz curve. Then, how can you use this to compute the Gini coefficient? And so, indeed, you can compute the Gini coefficient directly from your Lorenz curve. There are other ways to compute the Lorenz curve, other formula that you can use, at least three others. But we, in this course, will focus on a you know, Lorenz curve basis for computing the Gini coefficient. Although, if you know another way to compute the Gini coefficient, and you need to, co to compute one, you're always welcome to use it. All right, so I will, at this point, leave off this episode. A good idea to have a look at the um, episode following, which examines how to build a Lorenz curve from data.